I think this is the most important thing of all, and that's why I put it first. And I know that many of us, perhaps all of us, struggle at times in the area of prayer. It is so hard to, to maintain a daily, a proper daily prayer life. We make our resolutions and then we break them. And sometimes the force of circumstances are such that they just get broken. We didn't plan on it. We don't want it that way, but it just happens. Then we try to catch up and can't catch up. And then we get discouraged and we get confused. Satan wars against us in the area of prayer more than in any other area. Andrew Murray, in one of his books on prayer, one of the first books on prayer he ever wrote, The Ministry of Intercession, I think is the title, back in his day, he said that wherever he went in the world, Christians told him, my number one problem is my prayer life. And that was a hundred years or more ago. And it is no different today. Satan will fight your prayer life, won't he'll fight anything. Because if he can undermine your prayer life, he'll undermine your spiritual life. If he undermines your spiritual life, your Bible reading and your walk with the Lord will cease. Once your spiritual life has ceased and once you no longer live in that spiritual world you're supposed to live in, then you're just like an unsaved man tossed to and fro with every wind and doctrine. So therefore prayer becomes the anchor of your soul. And if a man's not praying, then that man has already reached a point, whether you want to admit it or not, where you should not be, you're starting down the wrong direction. The Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest example in all the Bible of someone who prayed. When you don't pray, I'm going to tell you a few things that's going on. Number one, you tell God you have no desire to commune with Him. That's what you're saying to the Lord. You're saying that I don't need communion with God when you don't pray. Now, folks, what I'm going to preach to you this morning, it may be hard, but it's necessary. For if your prayer life has died and you're no longer talking to the Lord, you need to start it up again. Make no mistake about it. You need to go back where you pray. You find that place as, as Abraham did when he went back to Bethel, to the place that he'd raised the altar before the Bible said, unto the Lord. And there the scripture says, he called upon the name of the Lord. Abraham had spent 13 years in Egypt. And as far as we know, hadn't prayed the first prayer. But when he came to Bethel, he came to the house of God. He came back to the place of prayer. You have no desire. You really don't if you've quit praying. Number two, you tell God you can run your life yourself. And you really don't need him as part of what's going on inside your life. You're saying that I'll take the reins of my life, Lord, here from now on. And I'll be the one who makes the decisions about when I get up, when I go to bed, where I go, who I talk to, what I read, what I entertain myself with, what I am. From this day on, I'm going to do it on my own. I don't need your help, Lord, when you're not praying. Number three, you tell God you can handle your spiritual warfare when you stop praying. You've quit the battle. It's hard. I know it is. It's a real warfare. That's why the Bible said to war, that we are warring a warfare. And the scripture says when a man wars that kind of warfare, he doesn't entangle himself with the things of the world. So you're telling God that you're through with the spiritual battle that rages. Now, folks, I don't know if you understand this morning, but Satan's after your children. He's after your wife. He's after your husband. He's after your family. He's after your fortune. He's after your mind. He's after your peace. He's after your salvation. If he could get it, he'll take everything he can get his slammy hands on. He'll drag you down to a depth that you never imagined you could go to. And he'll destroy everything that's precious in your life. I have talked to time and time and time again men and women who looked at me and said, Preacher, I never imagined that it could ever get this bad, that I could get to where I am now. But friend, they didn't get there overnight. It didn't happen in a moment. It, it's always a matter of drifting, drifting, drifting. And folks, a ship drifts because it has no anchor where it anchors or it has no, it has no captain at the helm. So my friend, you have, you can tell, you're telling God that you can handle your spiritual warfare. Number four, you tell God your profession is scan deep, not from the heart. When you quit praying, 
you're telling the Lord? Oh, I make a lot of racket. I do a lot of talking. I still profess to believe this and believe that, but it's no more than skin deep. For when a man is not praying, it's not coming from his heart. The Bible said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So the heart must be engaged in prayer. It's a precious gift. It's a blessed gift. It's a thing according to James chapter number 5 that can move mountains. But it's the most neglected of all the things in the Christian's life. And that is prayer. I'm telling you as one that's been saved since 1973. Quite a while, folks. The one thing that Satan has fought more in my life than anything else. And that is my prayer closet and my prayer time with the Lord. He's fought it. He does it by discouragement. He does it by keeping you too busy. He does it by distractions. He does it by getting with the wrong crowd. He does it by false doctrine. He does it by every imaginable thing that you can imagine. Satan is going to fight your prayer life. Why, preacher? Because prayer binds up the devil. Prayer opens up the gates of heaven. Prayer carries you higher than you could ever carry yourself in your mind. Prayer is a spiritual thing. It's a weapon. It's a battle we fight. And it can reach into the very throne room of God. It can reach to the right hand of Almighty God. And when you've stopped praying, that means literally, whether you admit it or not, I give up. When you stop praying, you're saying, I throw in the towel. When you stop praying, you're saying, I've had enough. I'm not going to be able to do this. I just can't keep it up. But I say to you this morning, you can't keep it up. It's not in you to keep it up because prayer is a spiritual thing. And my friend, God never tells you one time to generate or originate anything spiritual. It's a gift from God. According to 1 Corinthians 12, it cometh down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. If you've been out of that prayer closet for a long time, you haven't prayed, you haven't prayed anywhere, as this preacher in this morning is encouraging you to get back because that's going to be the heart and soul of your faith in the Lord. You tell God your profession is just skin deep. Number five, you tell God that Christ needed to pray, but you don't. When I look at the life of the sinless Son of God, and I think of how my friend and no guile was found in him, Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in him. When I consider the one that walked on water, the one that could raise the dead, he could heal the sick and cast out devils, and yet he'd spend all night long in prayer. He'd get in a desert place alone time and time and time again. He would get away from the crowd. He got alone with God. And I'm telling you this morning that your finest time with the Lord, your finest hour with God, will be when you get alone with Him. You get alone with Him. Just you and the Lord find you a place. If it's by a riverside, if it's in the woods, if it's in a closet, get in your car and drive off somewhere. But when you get alone with God, you'll find your prayer takes on new meaning. Prayer is an experience. Prayer is a journey. Prayer is a new world. Prayer is a powerful thing. The New Testament word translated prayer is proskuneko. And that word literally means to prostrate oneself before Almighty God, to live yourself bare before the one that you believe in. If you want him to read you, let him read you. If you want to walk with him, he'll read you. He'll look deeper into your heart than you want to go. He'll tell you things that you don't want to know. But when Almighty God begins to commune with you, he'll make you better. He'll make you stronger. You'll walk deeper. It'll be, a, it'll be an experience that nothing else can change. There is no substitute for prayer. No substitute. Bible reading, Bible memorization thank God for it and you need to do it and we've got a brother in here that does a good job of memorizing scripture and I encourage you to do that too please do that as much as you can but that in itself is not a substitute for prayer there is no substitute for prayer and that's something we can all do if you're born again by the grace of God you may not have a tongue but you can still pray you may not be able to walk, but you can still pray. You may be confined to a building and can't get out of it, but you can still pray. Prayer cannot be taken from you because wherever you find yourself locked behind a prison wall, you can still pray. On the foreign field, in a battlefield, you can pray. Wherever you are, you can pray. That's why the Bible said, I would that all men pray. Pray always and at all time. Talk to the good Lord. Number five. 
have. You can tell God that Christ needed to pray, but you don't need to. Oh, what a thing to say. Number six, you can tell God that all the commands in Scripture to pray mean nothing to you. You're holding the Word of God. You're taking it in what the Bible says that it really means nothing to you. You give it lip service, but it doesn't affect your life. Prayer, therefore, becomes the heartbeat and soul. You live it, you breathe it. It's what you are. It's all about what defines who you are is prayer. And when you stop praying, folks, you quit. Why and when you pray, let me tell you some of the things that happen. First of all, your soul is refreshed and cleansed. When you come to the Lord and begin to part your heart and your soul to Him and lay those burdens down at His feet, and man, do we ever have burdens? He said, cast my your care upon me, for I care for you. He said, he said take your, my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. My friend, your soul will be refreshed. Your You'll come away feeling clean. You'll come away feeling like you've been energized. You'll come away feeling like a burden has been lifted. When you talk to the good Lord and empty your heart to Him, you'll find one that'll lift the burden from you. And you'll come up from there ready to shout and praise God. A simple prayer can make all the difference in your life this day when you pour your heart out to Him. Number two, when you pray, your view of time and eternity will begin to change. If Satan can keep your mind tied up with the here and the now, with temporal things, things that literally are insignificant, he can take you away from the real issues of life. My friend, if you're born again, you ought to be thinking about eternity. And my friend, not time. You ought to be thinking about that which is spiritual and not that which is carnal. And you ought to be thinking about that which is holy and not that which is vain and that which is as of this earth. My friend, when you begin to search God, seek him out, talk to him. You'll be amazed at how your perspective begins to change. You see men as trees walking, do you? Do you understand that the earth is of the earth and that death is of this earth? But I belong to a land where there is no crying and no pain. At any moment I could say my last word, take my last step, but mark this down. It won't be sad for me. It'll be the grandest day that I live is when I take that next breath in glory. Think about eternity. For the here and the now is what Satan will tie you up with. But if your prayer life is what it ought to be, you'll be thinking about eternity. You'll be thinking about holiness. You'll be thinking about spiritual things. Number four. Your need for the Lord is realized. If you get your eyes upon Him and you begin to focus upon Him and begin to talk to Him, you'll begin to desire Him. You'll want Him. And He is what you're crying out for. You're trying to satisfy yourself with stuff. You're piling it up around you. Buying everything you can get your hands on. And you play with it like a child for a while. Throw it down and you got to have something else. That's the way the flesh is. It can never be satisfied. But touch Him one time and your soul is set on fire. He satisfies you like nothing else does. There's a great big need inside you and that need is for the Lord. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee. I need Him, friend. I need Him more than I recognize that I need Him. More than I understand it. I need the Lord. I need Him when I get up and when I go to bed. I need Him when I breathe and when I eat. I need Him when I walk and when I think. I need Him just to live. I can't live without Him. My friend, when you pray, you begin to see God answer prayer. Yeah, have you ever seen Him answer a prayer? Have you ever seen Him answer a prayer? Have you really ever seen God answer a prayer? Answered prayer is one of the most remarkable things in the world. He can answer your prayer. Call on His name today and He'll answer it. Call on Him. He said, Call unto me and I'll answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. I know it's quiet in here. I know it was real quiet. I know that. And I'm not up here to beat you over the head about not praying. Everybody goes through spiritual battles and struggles. But my dear friend, I will not make an excuse for it. You need to pray.